Dzień dobry Państwu, życzę wszystkiego najlepszego w nowym roku i dzisiaj będziemy mówić na temat budowania clusters. Przejdę na angielski teraz. So the topic of today's lecture is clustering and as we see in this definition in Wikipedia, clustering or cluster analysis is the task of grouping objects in such a way that the objects in the same group are more similar to each other than to those in other groups. So let's see what we have here on our first slide. So how many clusters do we have? If we just look at the squares, obviously we have three clusters because we have these three different colors, yellow, red, and blue. But on the other hand, if we look at all the objects on the, in this title slide, we also see that we could group together the objects we have, which have letters, so for example, clustering and the uh, description of clustering from Wikipedia could be put together as the fourth cluster, or possibly we could split clustering at, uh, in the title and cluster analysis definition uh, into two different clusters because they have different size letters. So uh, the moral of this discussion is that we can have different grouping of the same sets of objects into clusters and, it, it, and how we group them depends on the algorithm that we use and on the features that we use to choose the clusters. So we're going to see some examples in a minute. Right, but before we go there, let's talk about the plan of, of today's lectures. So today we're going to talk about uh, clustering, and uh, we're going to start with an example of which uses Weka, which you are familiar with, and uh, we're going to try to cluster some data about the fictional BMW dealership, and we're going to in particular try to answer questions: what the numbers are telling us about the customers, and what improvements can a business implement, this business implement. Then we're going to switch to talk about clustering in search. We're going to give examples of clustering in some other domains, uh, talk about marketing, and then uh, uh, for the last 15-20 minutes we're going to discuss the algorithms for clustering. So let's start. Uh, you're going to get uh, the information that we refer to in these slides uh, in, uh, in the mail in a few minutes after uh, this lecture is over, but let's uh, discuss what uh, the material is about. So first of all, when it comes to clustering in Weka, there is a plenty of material online. If you Google it, you're going to find videos, you're going to find some other information. Uh, we will use the file called BMW Browsers ARF. ARF is the uh, format that Weka uses. And uh, the example we uh, going to use today comes from uh, Googling clustering in Weka and coming into this link on IBM developers work. And I think it's a very neat example with very good analysis, so that's why I'm using it. Uh, so, what you see here is a relation car browsers with the attributes, which is dealership, showroom, computer search, N5, 3 series, Z4, financing, and purchase. All right, so uh, starting with the bottom, so purchase uh, can be 0 or 1, and it means either the customer bought the car or they didn't. Financing means that the customer got the financing or uh, he or she didn't. And then uh, the next uh, three rows talk about the types of uh, vehicles that uh, the customer has seen, uh, whether the customer used computer search on premises, okay, is the next attribute going from the bottom, and then whether the uh, customer uh, appeared in the showroom, had a discussion in the showroom, or appeared in dealership. All right, so that's essentially what uh, what these attributes say, and now let's look what we can do with them. So 
Weka provides several options for clustering, and you can see some of these algorithms here. Uh, the algorithm that is implemented in this, used in this example is k-means. k-means means, means that you have to specify the number of clusters, and uh, then the algorithm will put documents into the prescribed number of clusters. How it's going to be done, uh, we're going to discuss later in the lecture, but right now let's just go through the motions. There are some other algorithms which can uh, uh, automatically create a number of clusters. So for example, the expectation maximization uh, algorithm, EM, uh, we do it uh, among the algorithms from this list. So uh, what you see here is uh, the basic parameters in simple k-means. We are using n equals 5, so 5 clusters. And uh, we, I mean, this is done over eight iterations so with the standard uh, Weka parameters. All right. So once we run it, we're going to see these results. So we have uh, generated five clusters uh, with the numbers from 0 to 4. And we have different numbers of uh, examples in each clusters, different number of data points. And... Uh, the question is, what do these clusters tell us about uh, the customs? Right? Clustering is very often used to understand the data better because uh, we get some collection of data. Uh, many times it's a lot of data. And uh, the idea is uh, that we first understand the data better and then perhaps use use it for prediction or maybe use it for some action or some business improvement. So we're going to go through uh, this example to understand first uh, what it is that uh, these data tells us about the customer and then what it is that the business can do to improve their operations. Okay, so we're going to do it cluster by cluster. So as you can see in this, uh, in this example, uh, if you look at the data in, in, for each of the clusters, you can see that in some cases the values are zeros, in some cases the values are one. So, for example, in cluster number three, financing and purchase is one, so all the customers there got their financing and uh, got, uh, got their vehicles. Okay? So the question is what, is, what is the meaning of all of that? So let's do it uh, one by one. Okay? So what, what do the numbers tell us about the customers and what can the dealership do? So the cluster zero, okay, is what can be called as dreamers. So we can see that uh, the, uh, these customers didn't buy anything, okay, so the purchase value is zero. So these people parked outside the lot, okay, uh, they didn't purchase anything, so it's not clear what can be done about it, right? Uh, cluster 1 is uh, something which is called M5 lovers, okay? So they go to M5, they ignore the 3 series and the Z4s, but uh, they have only the purchase rate only 52%, uh, so the question is what it is that can be done, all right? So you can think about it. So, I mean, uh, there could be numerous options here for the dealership, uh, so assign more people, try to show them some other cars, uh, arrange better financing. Okay, so for example, if we look at the value of financing, you know, the 60% of these customers were uh, eligible for financing, maybe if the number was higher, also the sales would be high. So the, this is the balance of the risk of financing and, you know, and the reward in in profit. Uh, cluster number two has only five examples, so essentially we can't draw any conclusions. The number of, uh, of examples is too small. And if this happens, maybe we should reduce the number of clusters to four, or maybe we should simply ignore these, uh, this particular cluster, and this particular set of examples in the data. Uh, that is often the case, and sometimes it's referred to 
uh, in data mining as uh, the removal of the outliers, right? Uh, cluster number three, okay, so uh, they always end up purchasing a car and always end up financing, so this is the best, the most profitable for the dealership uh, set of customers, okay, so what we can see that they walk uh, around a lot looking for cars, they use the computer search, they either buy M5 or Z4, and number three series, so uh, the one of the action items uh, uh, that follows from that is that the dealership should consider making such component, the uh, such computers more prominent, and also making M5 or Z4 uh, showing higher up in search results, right? And so uh, there is no issue in qualifying for finance. Okay, so this is this is really an easy case, and. Uh, the solutions to keep these customers happy seem to be relatively simple. And cluster number four is uh, people who are starting with the BMW. They always look at three series. They never look at more expensive than five. Uh, they about half of them gets into financing, but only uh, 32 actually buy. Okay, so. Uh, They know the they know that they want I mean these customers know that they want the three series entry level model and they are hoping that uh, they qualify for financing to be able to afford it. So the dealership again the action here can be uh, relaxing the financing standard or reducing the three series price. So what what is easier it's, it's not clear, but uh, very often. Uh, people who are starting with uh, one dealership come back and buy a more expensive car later. So, so some kind of uh, predictive analytics with additional sets of data might be helpful here. Right, so this is an example of uh, using clustering to explore the data to understand better what uh, the customers of the dealership are, what actions are possible for the dealership, and uh, it gives us sort of a feel for what it is that uh, clustering is capable of providing, right? So let's look at some other examples. So uh, for text clustering, okay, we have a, a fact which is interesting that major internet search engines such as Google, Bing, and Yahoo do not cluster their results. Why? This is the case. Uh, the reason is that clustering sometimes can be computationally expensive. Second, the clustering does not necessarily add much value, okay, for internet search. Uh, internet search engines can use something like PageRank that we talked about uh, some time ago uh, to improve the search results. They also know what other uh, customers of the search engine are looking for from click-through rates, so similar queries are asked very often by the same set, by a large set of customers, and uh, therefore from the click-through rates, uh, Google, Bing, or Yahoo can uh, figure out what it is that uh, these people really want. There are some such engines that do, we're going to see one example below. And uh, essentially, they are trying to uh, create some competitive advantage for themselves. Uh, as a homework, I would like you to look at uh, 12 such engine alternatives to Google, Bing, and Yahoo, and find out if any of these actually cluster the results. Okay, so the link is at the bottom of the page. You click on it. And then you look at, uh, uh, at the search engines that are described in the link. So please do that and uh, see if any of these actually cluster. And it's also interesting to see uh, the diversity in how people approach search, something that goes beyond the standard three of Google, Bing, and Yahoo. All right, so here we have an example of a Yippee search engine that uh, 
does clustering of search results. So here we, we see uh, two examples of clusters, so two queries about Clinton, okay, or Clinton time. And uh, we see that, uh, that uh, there are different topics associated with it. Uh, obviously, the query is ambiguous, okay, it may be, you know, somebody looking for Hillary Clinton or uh, Bill Clinton for the relationship between Obama and Clinton, uh, for the Clinton scandals, or many other things, okay, or Clinton jokes, for, for example. So, uh, clustering gives us here some opportunity to look at certain results, okay, and well, there are also some other topics, so we can see them, uh, some of them uh, shown uh, in the expansion here, right? So, Obama is, uh, has, in this case, 11 documents about the relationship between Obama and Clinton time, and uh, uh, you can see some of them. Whether these results are good or not, it depends, depends what, what you're looking for, but at least you have an option. All right? Uh, in enterprise search, the, these entries do not uh, have the option of using click-through rates uh, or using uh, the page rank the way uh, web search engines can. So therefore, enterprise search engines often allow the clustering. Uh, and we're going to see it in the next slide. So another question is, okay, uh, if you use Amazon.com, okay, the large uh, provider of online shopping, uh, does Amazon cluster search results or are they classifying them? So please take a look and try to figure out the answer to this question. Solar is the most popular search engine very widely used in the enterprise. And here we, have, we can see some examples of clustering. So we can see clustering uh, using uh, some a set of, uh, ob of uh, uh, two-dimensional objects. So we can see here, for example, cluster family history, names formed, other topics. <coughs> and we can see the same set of clusters uh, in uh, uh, as a list of of clusters. Okay, so we can see it better. The next slide. So here is the list, uh, the list of clusters. So this is quite useful uh, if you want to better understand the set uh, of results. So uh, clustering can be used within the enterprise. It is useful and uh, for the most popular uh, enterprise search engine uh, allows us to, to do this clustering uh, using the carrot uh, toolkit. This slide uh, shows a few other applications of clustering. So, for example, in human genetic clustering, Genetic data is used to, uh, to infer population structures. In medical imaging, uh, we want to understand the differences between tissue and blood. Okay? Uh, in social network anal analysis, uh, we can use clustering to recognize communities. All right? In crime analysis, we can use it to better manage law enforcement resources, essentially sending the police to the place where there are there are hotspots of crime. Social data mining, we can identify students which have similar characteristics. So, for example, they might require some additional intervention or they might require uh, providing of a school breakfast or they could require something else, right? But the point is that, again, we can use uh, some numbers about students to, to understand better how they group and then assign teachers or assign uh, the students to special programs. 
And uh, similarly for robotics, uh, we instead of you know grouping uh, grouping students, we can group objects and understand which objects should be uh, present and which objects shouldn't be present, and possibly uh, teach the robot to do something about it. So for each of these questions, please uh, think about the value provided by clustering. Okay, so. Uh, the idea here is similar to what we discussed in the example of the BMW dealership, namely that uh, there are some actions that uh, the dealership could take, and in this case is also based on the results of the clustering. Uh, whoever is ordering the clustering, for example, for education or for robotics, can then perform certain actions. Okay? And what is the value of these actions? So please uh, give it some thought. Uh, here we have an example of clustering in marketing. Okay, so the problem is developing marketing strategy in a new country. And the question is, what are the markets? How should the investments be distributed? And if uh, the marketing company can't afford to market everywhere, where should it focus, right? So uh, here is an example of clustering, uh, of clustering we used uh, for in China, okay, so essentially here we have the grouping of clusters based partly on geographic proximity, but not only. We're going to go through the features of, that I used in this cluster in, in, in a minute. And you can see sort of different colored clusters. Some of them are mega, some of them are large, some of them are small clusters, so this is essentially by size. But uh, some additional criteria were used, so let's look at those. All right. So, uh, For example, okay, we can see that uh, in this example that uh, the language spoken, whether it's uh, Cantonese or Mandarin, uh, makes a difference. Okay, so it's one of the features that's used in clustering. So even though the cities are very similar in other respects, they differ by the language that is spoken there. So that can be used there additionally as a feature, right? Uh, in addition to those, okay, we have demographic features, so like the average age, for example, or distribution, you know, of sexes, uh, income distribution, culture, media, okay, so who can we work with as a marketing company, uh, how are these clusters of cities connected by transport? Right? And this turns out to be a very profitable approach. So in this case, you know, we put the cities in, uh, in clusters, and uh, the numbers are not provided here for China, but they are provided by, uh, for India. And in India, the costs were of marketing were cut by half by concentrating on eight large urban cluster rather than authentic plot strategy for 200 different cities. So, you know, 50% uh, uh, price say savings on, uh, on marketing campaign is big. So, so we can see another real example where clustering can provide some help. So the question is, okay, uh, would you imagine that these clusters would be built similarly to the BMW example. If yes, how would you go about it? If not, why couldn't you use something similar? So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about cluster, how clustering can be done. So let's discuss clustering algorithms. So to cluster, we need a measure of similarity or, or several such measures, okay? We need an algorithm for grouping, so decide how we're going to put uh, items together. And uh, we need criteria for putting documents into the same cluster. So what are the features that we care about uh, that we're going to then uh, 
apply the measures of similarity to, uh, how do we create the vectors of documents? We know that, for example, we can uh, we can remove the stop words or not remove the stop words. But you know, do you remember that when we discussed uh, uh, text documents? And then we need to define the measure of similarity on the vectors. And this measure does not have to be the same for all the features. So we can decide, you know, how how we want to play with it. So there are, you know, many options here. Uh, and uh, let's discuss some of the basic ideas. So some examples of similarity of documents would be shared word counts, okay? Uh, word count and bonus for rare words. And then cosine similarity, which can be applied both to words and uh, to documents that contain words and also to documents which are purely based on, on numbers, all right? And uh, we know that uh, of the correspondence between the matrix, document matrix and number matrices, I mean, they look uh, very similar. Okay, so the BMW uh, matrix that we saw in one of the first slides it contains entries which are 0 and 1, and that is very similar to uh, the binary term document matrix that we discussed uh, some time ago in October or November. Right, so let's uh, talk a little bit how this is done. Okay, so this is the uh, term document matrix. So in this case, we have term document matrix that creates the counts. Okay, so we mentioned the binary term document matrix. Uh, this is the count term document matrix. And we also discussed uh, TF, IDF document matrix, which we also uh, will mention in a few slides. Right. So this is the term document matrix. And uh, as before, we have to decide, OK, can we ignore the stop words? How do we go about it? Uh, which words should be more important? OK, so which document should be the you know, most, most important uh, answer to the query entropy algorithm complexity? OK, it should be the D1 or D4. How do we go about it? So TFIDF could be one of the options, so we do not talk about it in this slide. So as you remember, TFITF is term frequency of word times inverse document frequency of word. So this product it gives us the TFITF measure. Term frequency is number of times the words appears in the document. And the inverse document frequency is uh, some measure which tells us how frequent the uh, term is in the in the in the in all documents. Okay, so in the first case we are focusing on the specific documents for term frequency. For inverse document frequency we talk about the words in the context of all documents. And we want uh, this value to be small or close to zero for words which appear very often. Okay. So and that's indeed the case if the word appears in all documents, the logarithm of 1 is 0, and its inverse document frequency is 0, so the product is also 0. All right, so that's uh, that's the review of TFIDF, which we also discussed before. Uh, so uh, uh, these questions, I mean, we also discussed, so can we review them? All right, so <laughs> similarity can be described by shared words. So the way to do it is to think of a document, okay, of the document number i, okay, so i can be 1 to n, for example, as a binary vector, okay, so bij means that the i document contains j's word if bij is 1, and it is uh, 0 if the J's word is not in the document. Okay, so we have, uh, for example, this term document matrix or labeled spreadsheet that I, it's called in the fundament, in the book on fundamentals of predictive text mining. And then we can measure the similarity of a, a new document or some other document by uh, scoring the, using the similarity uh, computed by inner 
product or to vectors essentially we add uh, all big compute day uh, component product and we add all the values so it's going to be some sum of ones in this case all right so you have the similar discourse for this example vectors here and uh, uh, we can then modify this idea of computing similarity by inner product by adding some variance of it. So instead of just talking about shared words, we can uh, introduce uh, some measures of frequency. So in this case, okay, we compute the similarity scores. So, so we have the same situation as before, uh, uh, but we add one plus one over document frequency of the word. So the most frequent documents do not get much bonus, but the rare, sorry, the most frequent words do not get much bonus, but the rare words do. So if the, the word appears only once, it gets a bonus, I mean, the, the value is multiplied by two, so uh, there is, there is uh, bonus for rare words which are shared between the vector and uh, the documents which are in labeled spreadsheet. Uh, note that the length of the vector here is 4 and the labeled spreadsheet has 5 columns. The fifth column there is for the class, so we can ignore it here. All right, so, and so the documents have only four words. We are dealing with four word documents, but uh, the fifth column here is for the uh, for the class of the document, which uh, doesn't interest not, uh, us at this point. Uh, it may be relevant later because uh, we can also use clustering for classification. However, uh, we will not have time to talk about it. All right, so the final uh, uh, measure of similarity that we will discuss today is the cosine similarity. Uh, so we still care about shared words, uh, but we're going to do it, uh, okay, by uh, multiplying, okay, the vectors as before. Uh, we replace bonus with weights, okay, so instead of having one plus one other document frequency, we now have weight. And in the next slide, we're going to see how we compute this weight. And all of this is normalized, okay? So we divide it by the length of the two vectors, with the idea being that the cosine should be between 0 and 1. Okay, so this, so 1, uh, the documents are very similar, and 0 if they are absolutely not soon. All right, so uh, this slide tells us how to uh, compute the weight. And it, as we can see here, the weight in this example is uh, simply TF-IDF, but the norm is computed as the length of the vector, right? So that's, that's uh, the way of computing the cosine similarity. I'm pretty sure that we discussed something similar before. All right, so now that we know how to group uh, similar documents, what is the similarity measure? Uh, sorry, now that we know what the similarities measure are, we can we have certain options for grouping them. Okay, so one example here would be the hierarchical clustering, where we start simply with a collection of documents, and we can see sort of visually here that uh, more similar documents are closer. Um, and we end up with a tree, okay? So uh, how this is done? Well, we essentially put all documents on the line, on the top line, and then we apply the similarity measures one by one. So we group B and C together because they are very close, similarly D and E. Uh, then F is close to D and E, so we get D, E, F. Uh, then uh, to get the cluster B, C, D, E, F, 
uh, we observe that the E and B, sorry, B C and D E F are close to each other, and finally we get one big cluster containing all documents. So the question is, where do we stop? What is the what is the better cluster collection of clusters? Is it A B C D E F or is it A B C D E? And there are uh, some stopping criteria which we can uh, which we can discover, for example, by look, looking at Wikipedia article on clustering. But we do, will not have time to do it today. Very often, uh, these stopping criteria done are discovered empirically, that is, we try different ways uh, of clustering and then we uh, choose the number of clusters which work, which looks best, right? or which satisfies certain uh, numeric uh, criteria, such as the so-called perplexity. Right? So, uh, so the point here is to tell you that essentially we have two ways of doing clustering, so top, top down, as you can see in this example, or bottom up, as we will see in a moment. So k-means clustering is the bottom up clustering. It essentially has five steps, so we uh, choose our number, so the number can be two, it can be five. It can be 10, depending how many clusters we believe uh, are reasonable. Uh, very often, again, we're going to experiment with several values uh, for the clusters. And then we compute so-called mean vector for each uh, bin. Okay? So, and uh, we compute similarity of each document to, to each median okay, or mean. And then we move. And then we repeat this process until until it stabilizes. So, uh, what is the mean vector? Okay, so the, the mean vector is basically we take the average of every coordinate. So, if we have one to three, three to zero, and one one, we add one three and one and divide by three, and this gives us one six six. We add two two and one, which is five. We divide it by three again, we get one six six. And we take the last coordinate, uh, which is 3, 0, and 1, uh, which gives us 4. We divide it by 3, and we get 1, 3, 3. So this is our composite mean vector. So now, how this is done? Uh, we can use similarity scores to compare clusters, okay, and compute the similarity between the vector and the clusters, okay? So let's look how k-means clustering can be done. So, uh, as I said before, we have these five steps. So, in the first step, we essentially randomly distribute the documents among clusters, and you can see this in the figure below, all right? And then we're going to continue, okay? So, we're going to compute the mean vectors. So, in this case, we're going to, instead of having number four, as in this figure on the, on the, on, on the slide that you currently see, we're going to have just two clusters because otherwise it gets too complicated to put on one slide. So we're going to uh, do it with two clusters. So we have the input. And the input here are vectors consisting of only one number, just to keep it simple. So we have the 0, 4, 2, 3, 4. So we have five vectors. Each vector consists of one number. And that's our input, okay? We essentially can think of it as this is our starting cluster. Now, in step one, we randomly assign uh, the vectors to each cluster. Noting, note that four appears twice, okay? So this is, I mean, very often you, you find similar documents, so it's not surprising that similarly looking vectors uh, might appear twice in a collection or even identical documents. Okay? appear in the collection. We, after this random assignment, we get uh, in cluster 0, we have documents 0 and 4. In cluster 1, we have documents 2, 3, and 4. We compute the mean values. Okay, so 0 plus 4 is 4, divided by the number of documents in the cluster. We have two documents, so we get the mean of 2. 
uh, 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 9. If we compute the mean value, 9 divided by 3, the number of documents, give us 3 as the mean value of the vector. Right? Uh, then we do the comparisons. Okay, so we again look at the numbers 0, 4, 2, 3, 4, and we see what is the closest mean. So uh, 0 obviously is closer to 4 than, uh, sorry, closer to 2 than to 3, so it goes to the cluster which has 2, so uh, the, the mean value of 2. Uh, 2 is also closer there because it's the same value, and uh, for the 4, 3, and 4, again, they are closer to 3 than they are closer to 2. Uh, so we get our two clusters, 0 and 2, and the second cluster, 4, 3, and 4. Compute the means. For the first cluster, it's 1. For the second cluster, it's 3.67. Uh, we compare and assign to the closest mean, and again, uh, we discovered that 0 and 2 are closer to 1, but they are all closer to 3.6, uh, so they remain in cluster number 0, uh, and it turns out that 4, 3, and 4 are closer to 3.6 than to 1, uh, so we assign them to, cl to the second cluster. And since uh, the values haven't changed, I mean the, the documents in the clusters haven't changed, uh, the mean values won't change either, so we are done. I mean, we can't do anything else. So that is the final step of the means cluster. Uh, here we have another illustration of k-means clustering for the number 3. Uh, and uh, so we go through the same process. Essentially, we uh, create initial means. Okay, so we assign some uh, document randomly to three clusters. Uh, we uh, partition all the documents to the closest mean. Okay, and this is what we get in the in picture number two. We compute the new centroid or the new mean, and we reassign. Okay, so that's that's essentially how k-means clustering works. It's a very simple idea. Uh, it's a fast algorithm. Uh, it's uh, very widely used. Uh, there are many applications, so computer vision, geostatics, astronomy, agriculture. Uh, very often it's used as pre-processing step for other, other algorithms. Uh, and the rule of thumb often used for the number of clusters is the square root of number of data points. Uh, that is that doesn't always make sense, but you know, but you probably don't need uh, more than square root of data points, especially if uh, if your number of documents is very large. You probably need much less than that. If the number of documents is something under a couple of dozen, yeah, that's that's probably a good good starting point. So, so far, we discussed the clusters which every, which put documents, okay, or data points uh, in a cluster with the value of 0 and 1. The document either is in the cluster or is not in the cluster. However, in data mining, we also have technologies which allow us to uh, partition documents uh, into clusters which are more uh, forgiving, that is, they are not 0 and 1, but they are assigned with certain probabilities. So each document can belong to multiple topics, so, one, so a document can, uh, for example, discuss the uh, salary of a sports celebrity, so therefore it will be uh, relevant to both sports and celebrities and the finance. Okay, so it's it's about uh, multiple topics. So instead of just assigning it to one of these categories, 
uh, we can view it as a mixture of, say, sports, 30%, 25% finance, 25 celebrities, and some other topics, 20%. Okay, so this is the basic idea of topic modeling, that we have this kind of soft clusters. And the second idea in so-called topic modeling is that each cluster, in turn, is a mixture of words. So, for example, a cluster can talk about uh, children, women, child, years, and some other words. And essentially, since clusters are computed using uh, the distributions of words in documents, okay, we can, we can think of them also as being mixture of words. Uh, the computation of these mixtures and the computation of these clusters is not necessarily trivial. However, there are good algorithms and uh, there are good tools which allow us to explore such mixtures of words uh, uh, automatically. And one of them is the Stanford topic modeling tool that uh, I provide the link here for the homework. And I, what I would like you to do is uh, take the example that is provided in the topic modeling tool and essentially run it. Okay, it, uh, the tool is itself is written in the language called Scala. However, the only thing you need to change is a collection of parameters in a GUI, okay? And another thing, possibly, uh, you can change some of the parameters in the Scala scripts. Uh, these changes are very simple. You essentially have to assign a new file name or a new value for the number of topics or clusters that you want to compute. So that is, that is a relatively simple exercise and it's very well explained in the tutorial, so please do so. Uh, so here we have some example of uh, topics illustrated in colors. All right, so uh, the document here, which talks about uh, Hearst Foundation giving uh, $1.2 million to dollars to the Lincoln Center, Okay, so we can see that in this uh, case, topics consists of words. So arts, okay, is in red. So it has opera, New York, harmonic, performing, mark, bit, for some reason is in art. Um, new, okay, education, okay, which is on the right hand side, it has, is in a different color. Uh, and it has school taught school again, and for some reason also William. Okay, William is more associated with education uh, than, than with arts, and uh, there is possibly no good reason for it except that uh, in the so-called education documents, uh, William appears more often than uh, in the arts document. Okay, and we have two other topics, budgets and children. Okay, So uh, notice that this uh, set of words which appear in topic mixtures is not necessarily perfect, but it gives us some idea about what, um, what the document is about and what other documents might be about, and we can represent it very easily visually. Now, if we take the words for each mixture of topics, we can see that, uh, that most of these combinations make sense. This is happens in the next slide. All right. So here we have uh, the topics, topic words for arts, budget, children, and education. And most of them make sense. Some of them, I would say, are surprising, and we can guess why it is that uh, that they appear there. All right. So uh, so we saw. Uh, two ways of doing clustering. Okay, so one so-called hard clusters, zero and one, uh, which we saw uh, two algorithms for. One was the k-means algorithm, okay, where you compute the centroid of the mean values, 
and, and then keep reassigning until the process stabilizes. And the other, the hierarchical clustering, where you essentially put uh, your documents or so your data points in larger and larger uh, sets of clusters. Right? And the second way of doing clustering is uh, soft clustering. Okay, so one example of which it could be topic modeling, which is uh, currently very widely used, and not only in computer science, but also in other domains, for example, in the humanities. So, so this is one example of computing technology that uh, definitely migrated from computer science to other domains, and that's why I'm talking about it here. All right, so that's the summary, and uh, you should know uh, what these algorithms do, top-down versus bottom-up, what is the idea behind hard clusters and soft clusters, how the k-means clustering is performed. So, for example, if I give you another set of vectors uh, in your final exam to compute to do k-means uh, clustering, you should be able to do so. And you should know something about possible applications of clusters. So this concludes uh, today's lectures, the lecture, and if you have questions, I would be happy to answer. So are there any questions, I, and I can answer, hear them, or I can uh, see them uh, if you if you express your questions uh, in writing. So I'm gonna wait a minute or two, and if there are no questions, we're gonna conclude this lecture. If there are questions, I will answer. Them. Since I'm not hearing any questions, I'm going to conclude this presentation. Thank you very much.